And we are live on Great Lakes Shipwrecks Live. Um, Audience, all cheer. Good evening, everybody. Glad to uh, glad to have you with us on this uh, shut-in evening where we are all hunkered down, uh, uh, trying not to uh, get the dreaded COVID-19. Uh, we have a, a really good show ahead of us tonight. For those of you who don't know, tonight is uh, Taras Lysenko, the T and A and T Recovery. He's going to be uh, joining us tonight to talk about. Uh, really one of the most fascinating shows we've ever had, and that is uh, uh, his work to recover lost warbirds on Lake Michigan. And he has a new book, The Great Navy Birds of Lake Michigan. Excellent book. I uh, just got done uh, reading it in earnest. And um, in the process of uh, looking for those airplanes and raising some of them, he has inadvertently found a lot of shipwrecks. So we're gonna talk about that too. So I'm gonna give it a few minutes for people to join, and I'm gonna take care of some housekeeping announcements. Um, let's see, what do we have up? A uh, couple of things that I want to remind people of. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody who's uh, uh, joined the group recently. Uh, my gosh, uh, the group just hit 1,600 members. Um, as you know, most of you know, I started this thinking I'd have about 50 of my real geeky shipwreck buddies in here, you know, kind of researchy people. Uh, turns out that there was a, a, a niche that was needed to be filled. There's a lot of other Great Lakes Shipwreck people out there, too, as it turns out. So so welcome. We're really glad to have you. Um, thank you to those who answered our poll today on uh, what kind of content you wanted to see more of. Uh, we'll try to get that to you. Uh, I also wanted to remind people of a couple of new uh, pieces of content that I've put out recently. Um, we have some new videos. Uh, one of them I put out was uh, the latest Lost Ship of the Month. Uh, the Lost Ship of the Month this uh, month is the ship Jennifer that uh, sank in 1974 off Port Washington. And I uh, did an original workup on her, re-researched her from uh, original records. Turns out uh, she may be findable. So uh, watch that if you get a chance. It's uh, a, a good video and not terribly long. And then I also did a, a recently put out a video on a new Great Lakes uh, accident list from uh, of all the uh, marine accidents on the Great Lakes from 1863 to 1873 from the National Archives that I went through. So feel free to watch that. And there's a new one coming out tonight on the rec reports of the U.S. Life Saving Service. So feel free to join me for that. Um, make some comments if you if you can, just so I know that you are uh, that you're there. Uh, I'm not seeing anyone yet. Um, one Did thing that uh, the sponsors, yes, the sponsors, right? The, you know, uh, the, the forever water can for your being locked up with COVID-19. Isn't that a sponsor? You didn't get it. You didn't get the joke. Look, no, look at the, can. the forever at water can. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> go ahead. There we go. Just checking to make sure we're live on the site. All right. You didn't like my forever water can sponsor? No, I was <laughs> checking to see that we were live on the site. But no, oh my God, what is that? I'll explain it, but I think it was, a, I thought it was a good joke. The forever it's water can. It's our a forever water can. can. Yeah, forever water can. It's one of our sponsors. You know, it, <laughs> it helps you during COVID-19, you know, days. Okay. Very cool. So anyway, uh, that's the housekeeping part of the show. Um, and uh, for those of you who, uh, who, who don't know uh, about, about this, there are uh, well over 100 uh, World War II uh, warbirds uh, aircraft on the bottom of Lake Michigan from uh, training ships. Uh, they trained uh, people to fly airplanes off of aircraft carriers on the Great Lakes. And many of those ships wrecked. And Terrace is going to take us on a, on a deep dive into that. Well, he does that, I'd like to encourage people to post your questions to Terrace. Uh, in the past, we've waited until the end of the show to take those questions, but tonight we're going to encourage people to post those questions live uh, in the news group uh, throughout the show, and Terrace is going to take your questions. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'd really like to welcome Terrace Lysenko. I've known uh, Terrace not, 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 not well, but we've met many times over the years at different uh, Great Lakes events, the Ghost Ships Festival, things like that. But I've been well aware of Terrace's work because of all the shipwreck finds that ANT uh, Recovery has made. 
and some of them are really amazing shipwrecks. We're going to talk about some of those tonight, but first we're going to talk about the airplanes. So, Terrace, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, let's get started. Uh, I'm going to start some video in the background that Terrace has, has graciously shared with me. Uh, that we're just going to run as we go through the talk and uh, as we uh, ask answer some of the questions. So I'm going to get that rolling. And Terrace, um, I'm going to go ahead and remove myself from the stream and put up the, uh, the video. Um, there we go. And I'll take down the all right. Take down the text here because everybody knows that this is Great Lake Shipwrecks live now. All right. So, Terrace, one of the first things I always ask our guests, because people want to know, it's, it's always fascinated people, uh, how did you get interested in this? How did you first learn that there were airplanes on the bottom of Lake Michigan? I mean, that's really esoteric knowledge. And where did you get the idea of going to find these things and raise them? I mean, that's amazing. Tell me a little bit about that. Um, well, we actually didn't know about the aircraft when we started, but we started as a group of uh, boys, and there was a lot of us. It was probably 10 of us. We all grew up on the same street in the uh, uh, same urban street. And we, um, we, for some reason, we all seemed to like to explore and like to scuba dive. So um, Al, the A of A&T Recovery, um, said to me one day, because we had money, we worked, but we were young. We were really young. I was in my teens, probably 16, 17. Um, so let's go get a boat. So we, we got this boat that uh, really we held together with duct tape and we went out in Lake Michigan and we started looking. We, we started just like everybody else. We, goes, we went to the known shipwrecks and, um, and then we started to learn about what was called side scan sonar. And um, so <laughs> we, uh, we got a better boat at some point. Um, it was a better boat because Al found it sunk in a harbor in Florida and pulled it out and brought it up and we we fixed it. And then we got a, a side scan sonar and it didn't take long. We uh, actually located our first aircraft probably in 1977. We, we had, Al was out one day by himself and located a ship called the uh, Wings of the Wind. And then we located an aircraft, a uh, Wildcat fighter. And prior to that we had learned of the aircraft because a scuba club had located a tbf avenger and then they did kind of a weird thing they they picked it up from underwater and pulled it out on the navy pier but they didn't have a plan to do anything with it it was kind of odd so so we started looking for the aircraft and of course we uh well then well then we had college and i had college and i had military service and so we, there was a there was a kind of a delay, a several year delay from about 1978 to about 1985. And when I finished that, Al said, "Let's get a better boat, and and let's get a good side scan sonar." So we did, and we were really good at finding aircraft. We started finding them left and right right away. Wow. Um, yeah. That's Good amazing. Idea. So, and you, you really, I mean, how did you know about these planes that they were down there? I mean, I, I didn't know anything about this, and not many of us did, even Great Lakes Shipwreck people. Well, they, the the leader of the group that had, the scuba group that had found the TBF, um, we talked to him, and he he told us about it, and then some other people, Harry Zike, you remember Harry Zike? Oh, he yeah. told us about it because we uh, started talking to him. And then, and then we went to Washington, D.C., See, what happened in the war, they, because of the U-boats and the submarines, the U-boats on the East Coast and the submarines on the West Coast, they came up with an idea to put training aircraft carriers out on Lake Michigan. So they bought two excursion vessels, and, and people looking at the film saw the two excursion vessels that were converted into the USS Wolverine and the USS Sable. They bought those two excursion vessels, took the superstructures off, put flat tops on them, and they qualified uh, somewhere close to 15,000 pilots during the war. In the process, they lost about 130 aircraft in the lake. Um, you might That might sound like a lot, but it was a lot different in those days. They were in a hurry. Pilots didn't have a lot of experience. They might have 250 to 350 hours before they had to land on an aircraft carrier. 
tell somebody that with 350 hours of flying time now that they're going to land an aircraft carrier, they'll say you're out of your mind. So, and then they were smaller apparently than the normal aircraft carriers, the fleet carriers. So it wasn't exactly the easiest thing to do. They also were operating them so much that there were maintenance problems. A lot of engines would quit on them, just all kinds of weird things. So 130 actually was a small number. They, um, they did have some, they had the shallow ones, they would throw a buoy on, they would recover them. They had crash boats. There was a big myth that they didn't care about the pilots. That's a myth. They had crash boats to recover the pilots. They would throw buoys on the aircraft if they were shallow and they had a recovery crew. And I estimate they recovered about 10 of the aircraft during the war. Sure. So, so, so you, anyway, guys, go you guys searched a lot of lake bottom out there over the years. I mean, it's kind of legendary how much side scanning you guys did. And, and you have a real client side scan sonar. I mean, a real high-end commercial sonar how much of the bottom have you covered oh i i don't know just finding the uc 97 we covered 140 square miles but um in those days we were we were pretty loyal to eg and g and then edge tech we we like their systems um for a while we, for actually for a good percentage of the time we were beta test site for those those companies so we always had the state-of-the-art sonars to operate with which was kind of interesting you know that two two guys and then um, you know, uh, A&T Recovery is Air, Alan Terrace, and then there's Keith Pearson along with us. But for, for most of the time, we had we had the latest, greatest technology. The U.S. Navy didn't have as good a side scan systems as we had. So because we would be the beta test site and have good, we'd have, they would make the system and send it to our boat. So because um, we, we would spend 12 hours a day out there. We just would do that. That must have been really exciting. Uh, so, so you started to really actually it's pretty boring. Well, right, I think that kind of is. But you started to raise these planes and work with. You were working with the um, the Naval History and Heritage Command, and, and absolutely as, not. As people can see on these um, these these images, A and T raised a lot of planes. Uh, yeah. Tell me yeah. about where they go, where they go, and and what happens to them. You, you made a big mistake in your question. Oh, absolutely not. We've never worked with the Naval History and Heritage Command. They refuse to work with us. Oh. Now, now, if we were worth billions of dollars and they, they would definitely fall over themselves, even if we had had a, a museum of our own where we had gone around the world and taken aircraft out of jungles and out of out of uh, out of out of Russia. And 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 if we had done that and uh, they wouldn't care if we had billions of dollars because they're nothing but a pack of hypocrites, right? And and if so, if we had billions of dollars, they would fall on themselves to get on our boat because. But you know, we're just A and T recovery, a, a bunch of crazy guys. So, um, but it's so, my understanding, though, Terrace, that that you guys had like a would like a like a, an agreement with the military to, to raise these planes, and you guys were the yep. only ones who were legally able to do it. Yep. And that ended up being raised and, and, and being restored. Can you tell me a little? How did yeah. that happen? Okay, so the Naval History and Heritage Command is one of the most obstructive nutcase organizations that exists in our government. It's full of archaeologists who practice, practice an unbelievable cultist religion called archaeology. And if you wonder what's wrong with archaeology, well, just look who gave us the uh, the great belief that the Aryans were the superior race on the on earth. That was the archaeologist. Um, they, the archaeologist said the Mayans were peaceful, loving people, and Mayans were some of the most savage people that ever existed on this planet. Archaeologists recently, an archaeologist was caught creating, making up battles between uh, the Roman legions and people in, I guess, what would be considered Brittany. It, it's a sham. It's a total sham. It's, a, it's, it's unbelievable. It's all supposition and innuendo and wishful thinking and they've gotten themselves into the aircraft world they 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 say it's archaeology none of it's archaeology everything we do when we started doing it the pilots were still alive they could have spoken to the pilots they could have learned well everything all this stuff is in it's anyway so don't get me started on that <laughs> no that's okay I, I guess i what i want to understand is how how, how yeah. that happened that you got the the, the say the agreement to be able to raise these planes uh, it sounds like nowadays though that there's been some obstructionism now that there was a there's been obstruction sites. yeah there's been obstruction the whole time oh, the, but so yeah. you did raise a, a lot of these and they ended up in museums where you can actually see them right 
yeah, but I'm telling you, there's been obstruction the whole time. Gotcha. The, the thank God for the director and the deputy director of the National Naval Aviation Museum and the Naval Aviation Museum Foundation. Those people realized that this was such important history that it needed to be recovered, restored, and put on display throughout our country. And they, they're the ones who, who contracted with us. The National Naval Aviation Museum, with support from the Naval Aviation Museum Foundation, contracted with us to raise the dozens of aircraft we raised. Um, if it had been up to the Naval History and Heritage Command, every single one of these aircraft, like the one that's on the screen right now that looks really nice, um, would have would be well on their way to becoming aluminum oxide. And um, so it, it's those people that, that saved the aircraft in reality because they they identified how important this was to the present and future future generations. The um, it's, Anyway, that's, it's, that's simply how it is. And the entire, all along the way, the Naval History and Heritage Command has attempted to obstruct. I see. And they I just- up. I didn't understand. I thought they were the people you were working with. But so I appreciate nope. the clarification on that, Terrace. They, 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 will, they will lie and say they manage something. They don't manage anything. They are absolutely, and one of the things that's really disappointing to me, the new, the, the, the latest director, um, I actually thought he was going to change stuff there and save some of the rest of the aircraft. And, and he's just been a really big, bad disappointment because he can't seem to execute a single thing, you know, initiate, get a single thing going. And he, he'll make all kinds of statements that, that, you know, recovery proposals haven't been presented with funding and that's false. Those are false statements. We've, um, there's a, there's a funding mechanism in the U S government, uh, title 10, United States Code Section 2572 that we did a good number of the recoveries and restorations under and and proposals have been presented to him to recover several more aircraft that need to be recovered using that funding mechanism and he he gives me statements back that such as I'll see what black hole this has fallen into but then he'll publicly say there's no there's been no proposals which is it's false so it's um, his his staff at the underwater archaeology archaeology branch does everything they can to obstruct. But like I say, if I we were billionaires, and even if we had, uh, you know, taken aircraft from other places all over the world and put them in our private museum, oh, they'd fall all over themselves to help us. So it sounds like it's a real political environment. I, that brings up a question that I, I guess uh, I, we talked about a little bit. Is why not leave these on the bottom? There's a lot of people, archaeologists, who think that these are archaeological sites. Some divers think that, that these should be dive targets. Uh, why not leave them on the bottom? I thought you had a really good rationale for that. Well, the um, when we started out years ago, there was a lot of scuba divers that said that to us. Why don't you leave them on the bottom for us to dive? And we're not statisticians, but I'll just give you a set of numbers. We always looked at, you know, there's a, quite a few scuba divers that go into the Caribbean and look at pretty fish. To me, that gets boring. And um, but when you look at the number of scuba divers that dive in the Great Lakes and you look at, you know, what it takes to dive in the Great Lakes, dry suits and all that kind of stuff, the, the numbers of scuba divers gets really tiny. So um, say we took one of the aircraft, I'll give you an example of an aircraft. The aircraft is on display in Midway Airport. That aircraft was in about 85 feet of water when we located it. Even if we left that aircraft there and we gave it to the, the location to the entire sport diving community that would dive in Lake Michigan, my hunch is in a year you'd have 100 to 200 divers that would go spend 10 minutes or 20 minutes diving that. Over the past 30 years, maybe it would have been a thousand, several thousand people. By us recovering it, it being restored and putting on display at Midway Airport, over 5 million people a year see and learn their history from that aircraft. The aircraft that we've recovered are in about two dozen museums, prestigious museums in airports throughout this country, from, from Long Island, New York, down to Florida, you know, the, the four aircraft carrier museums that have them, to San Diego Air and Space Museum, all across this country, 
the National Museum of the Pacific War, the, the, the Museum of the United States Marine Corps, the National Naval Aviation Museum. Um, it's amazing, right? Every yeah. prestigious museum in this country that's aviation or, or war related, or not every, but most of them, have an aircraft that we've recovered. And I suppose, like you said too, they'd be all just aluminum oxide. A lot of these planes have a shelf life. A hundred years from now, these won't be planes anymore if they're left down there, will they? They won't be. So, so tens of millions of people see and learn from these things every year. And that will continue as long as there's the United States of America. The director of the underwater archeology span branch at Naval History and Heritage Command says, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if these were left on the bottom so some archeologists could find them in 100 and 150 years? I, I'm sorry, that's sick. That's disgusting. You know what that's like to me? That's like saying you have a 10 year old granddaughter and the 10 year old granddaughter has leukemia and some quack doctor has never seen the symptoms of leukemia. So that quack doctor says, oh, well, you know what? There's no point in, in us treating, treating her because there'll be a cure for her in 100 and 150 years. So we're just gonna sit here and watch her die. Yeah, and I mean, these aren't, won't be there in 150 years. I, I think that's true, right? I mean, these, these will be gone. They're not, they're, these aircraft are not going to be there in 10 years, yeah, 20 years. The zebra mussels. What have the zebra mussels done to these planes, Terrace? Well, it's now the guaga mussels, which are right, right, the guaga mussels. And it's very simple. The guaga mussel attaches itself with these little spiny things. Right. And we thought that would actually be the problem. We thought the little spiny things would pull paint off it. Right. But no, that's not the real problem. What the, what the problem is, is that they excrete things just like all biological organisms. Right. And their excretion is acidic, very similar to our excretions. We excrete uric acid, very similar. They, ex they excrete, they have an acidic ex excretion. So when you're looking at the videos, you see, you see they're covered. The guaga muscles cover the aircraft that places the aircraft in a constant acidic bath. Uh -huh. And I don't think I need to explain to any of your listeners what that does. Yeah. Um, that accelerates corrosion. I see the video, the, I think the next aircraft of your video will really show. Now this aircraft that's coming up right now is a Corsair that was about 300 feet deep. So it had a little more time, the guaga muscles weren't as bad for as long on this aircraft, but the next aircraft was about half the depth. And you will see how bad the corrosion has become on that. We, we have an aircraft that we were looking at that a museum wants to put on display just as it is in a hundred feet deep. It, it is absolutely, they have the entire cowling has corroded and it's no longer there. In other words, the entire cowling around the engine has turned into aluminum oxide and it's just part of the sand on the bottom. So the rest of the aircraft is following suit very quickly. And these, these things are down, down. We've been down at 600 feet and we're finding them at 600 feet. Wow. So, yeah, they're, yeah, so they're I mean, pretty bad. I, I'm a, I'm, I, if you can't tell, I, I'm a, so, a pretty big fan of actually bringing these up uh, as opposed to shipwrecks, which I, I, I don't believe in bringing them up obviously. But with respect to these planes, Terrace, I think you're doing the right thing. and. Uh, oh. Well, the really difference really work. Yeah, the difference between a, this and a shipwreck is we're able to we're able to raise enough money. Well, we used to be able to raise enough money. The Naval History and Heritage Command has put such a bad taste in 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 people's mouths. They're unwilling to they're unwilling to fund because of all the the red tape nonsense that Naval History and Heritage Command puts us through to try to get one of these recovered and restored. They it, it, it's amazing. Donors come forth all the time and say, you know, can we do this this summer? We would be willing to fund it. And and we tell them we have to do all this crazy stuff. You have to put your money into escrow account, all this stuff long before they'll say they'll, they'll approve it. And we don't know if they'll approve it, even if you put your money into escrow account. And I always say this to the director, the present director, if you would approve that we can recover and restore that based on can we raise the money, people that have means would then put money in. But but them putting money in, and it's happened multiple times, people have put money in, and then then it's then something's not approved. And and it really pisses off people of means because right, they 
they get all they get out of it is a bunch of accolades, right? They get some media and they get everybody saying thank you. So when they put in a bunch of money and it just sits there for years and years and years and lingers because the underwater archaeological branch and the and the worthless attorneys and naval history and heritage command stall out the progress, they they kill our our backing, our funders. Uh, we yeah. I just went through this. I just went through this the past couple months. I had a back for things and they're what they're doing. The backer said, I, no, no more. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I've had enough of them. So, that's really unfortunate. so and, and that's bad government. It's just, they, they have no business. They have no business in this in reality. So, so we have a question from the audience. Um, a uh, viewer asks, uh, tell us about, uh, you know, the most, your most interesting story about your most exciting aircraft find. I, I actually, d did you see the, the, the aircraft that looked like a skeleton? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's probably the most interesting. Um, just because it's a, it's the only one in the world. It's an SB2U-2 Vought Vindicator. They were obsolete when the war began. And believe it or not, the, uh, they, they were in the first part of the war up until the Battle of Midway. They gave them to Marines. And Marines, <laughs> Marines I don't know, Marines are crazy. Um, Marines on Midway Island used the, that type of aircraft, to uh, that was one of the types of aircraft they used to attack the Japanese Armada. So they had to be nuts because that thing was two-thirds fabric covered. Not that it matters if you have a little shin, thin sleet, sheet of aluminum between you and the, the fighter aircraft or a, a little sheet of fabric, but it was slow. It was <laughs> – anyway, but um, we were lucky that aircraft was lost in the lake, and it was, um, it was <laughs> just the whole dealing with it recovering it, finding it, everything. It was really easy for us to find it. We found it in probably two hours, all right, once we got really? out of the lake. But then getting it, rec <laughs> recovering it, because we, um, they have what's called the maintenance or erection and maintenance manuals. And so um, the they're kind of cryptic. They're designed to go along with a course during the war. So so we were trying to figure out how to lift it and it's, it's lifting assembly and all and it just, um, it ended up being an unbelievable lengthy project <laughs> because <laughs> it's because of the whole thing. I, I explain it in pretty good detail in the book, right? So I think you read it, right? But yep. that was, and that, you know, that's the most interesting aircraft. Now, everybody loves the, uh, that aircraft with the bent wings, which is called the Corsair. And, uh, I thought you took that out, the uh, new stuff out, but anyway, um, the um, the Birdcage Corsair, the um, everybody loves that because everybody loves those Corsairs, and that um, which is on the screen right now, the um, that one's really cool because it's a Birdcage. It was the Corsair that uh, almost you know would almost kill a bunch of pilots because it was so hard to land on an aircraft carrier. So anyway, sorry, Terrence. I. Uh yeah, I, I fast forwarded past the past that stuff. I forgot about that. I so a couple other questions people have been asking, and it's a good segue too. Um, one of the things that you mentioned in the book is that you've inadvertently really found a lot of shipwrecks out there just because you've covered so much bottom. Uh, yeah, there's only there's only two shipwrecks that we intentionally looked for. Um, sure. The first one was the Wellsburg, and I'm sure a lot of people dove that off of Evanston. And that, that was pretty quick. Al one day just said, let's go find the Wells Bird. I, I'm pretty agreeable on, on most things like that. And I said, uh, sure, okay, let's go. We, we found it. And uh, it was really cool. It was, we had never seen that intact of a shipwreck. Now, it when it when it sank in whatever, 1800, whatever, they they salvaged it, right? They took the they took the mast and anchors and all. So there, so there wasn't really much on it, but it was just kind of cool. But that, that ship we intentionally went and found, and we found it. And then um, we we went deliberately and found the UC-97, which for those people that don't know, it's a German World War I U-boat that was part of the, um, they called it the former German submarine expeditionary force. We, we The Germans surrendered 170-something U-boat uh, submarines at the end of the war to the allies in the United States. So what they did, they brought most of them to Harwich, England, and then they divided them up. And the U.S. took 
um, six U-boats and brought them to the U.S., brought them to New York Harbor. There was the UC-97, the, I think the U-117, the UB-88. So there was, there was a whole bunch, you know, we had six of them. And what they did was then they divided them up and sent them on bond drives and other uses. So they, the UC-97 was the Great Lakes one. And so they stopped at all kinds of cities and then they, it ended up in Chicago. They took the periscope out, they took one of the diesel engines out. And then they, according to the armistice, they had to destroy it at a certain, a certain time. So they took it out in Lake Michigan and they shelled it with a ship called the, um, the USS Wilmette. Um, do you know what the prior life of the USS Wilmette was? Oh, indeed I do. Yeah. So your viewers may, some of them may not know it was the Eastland, which was the, the worst, uh, marine tragedy disaster in the great lakes so 805 people died within minutes when it rolled over in the chicago river um so they um they um they sank it out there and lots of people went to look for it and uh lots of craziness but um so there's some images of it on your screen that was shot in 1992 um so interesting, you, you talk about the Naval History and Heritage Command. We've always offered to work with the uh, Naval History and Heritage Command. And the director, the present director, wanted his, his underwater archaeological branch people were saying that we were lying about having located the U-boat. Don't ask me why, but he actually told me they were saying that we hadn't located it. And so we took him out in 2017. We took him right to the U-boat and Keith, well, our ROV broke the day before, or the ROV we had with us broke the day before. If you know anything about these ROVs, we always say a board exploded. And that means it's about $10,000 in four weeks later that it can be fixed. And so Keith, Keith Pearson, I uh, went and bought a bunch of extension cords. He had a video camera, he, he rigged up a drop camera. So we, uh, that the night before we took to the, the, the director of Naval History and Heritage Command, Keith used a drop camera and showed him the U-boat. And very interesting thing this past summer. Oh, you know, we, all, we, we, they had asked us for positions of the aircraft and he asked us for the position, position of the U-boat. And we said, well, we'll work together on that. And we drew up a proposal to work together. Well, they don't want to work together with us. They just want us to give them positions. So they sent their, uh, they sent some of their nitwits out there and wasted a bunch of tax dollars. Believe it or not, they wasted federal tax dollars, um, at looking for the U-boat this summer. So, <laughs> And, and even though we, we can put, we put them right in the hatch, you know, and, um, but Hey, you know, they, they're, they they have this thing. They say they, they're, they're ethics, which is archeologists can't work for money, make money off of the, you know, the artifacts and stuff. Well, every one of these are these archeologists, uh, make money off of, off of history. They suck and they do it by sucking off the fatted cow, the American taxpayer. And, and so I think that is the the silver lining of the COVID nineteen virus. I don't think I don't think the fatted cow American taxpayer is going to be so fatted anymore. And I think we're going to be cutting a lot of money from a lot of useless stuff. And that hopefully, first thing they cut is the underwater archaeology branch and naval history and heritage command because those people have no business in our government. So um, anyway, I'll get so, off my show. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear your frustration with their obstructionism, and and uh, you know. Like I say, a lot of those planes, you know, aren't going to be there in a hundred years. I don't, I don't understand where they're coming from. That U-boat won't be there in a hundred years. No, that's true. So, uh, more about the shipwrecks. Uh, I've got a couple of people asking about the Chicora. So that is the one Chikora. of the OLX wrecks on Lake Michigan, and I believe that you found it. I saw the side scan image. Yeah. Now I'm not, I'm not an expert on, on these shipwrecks, you know, especially these steamships from, or any of them. I'm not an expert on any of these ships, but um, that's kind of, it's kind of interesting because we first, um, when we first had the side scan image and we released it publicly, it's interesting to see all the disputes, but the people I believe are the model makers. You, you know what I'm talking about? The people yeah. who make models. Yeah. There's, there's people that are dedicated to making models and, and there's there's some of them that are just so good with intricate detail, and these model makers started contacting us, looking at it, and and they said, by all their I don't know what they do, but they said they said they looked at so many other ships, and they say it matches, just matches. It just 
it, they think it's it. So I believe them, right? Um, you know, it's kind of shallow. I think we should grab a bunch of people and go diving on it. You know, all the ones that like to dive to about 600 feet. So um, you didn't laugh. No, I know it's deep. It's not a diveable wreck. But I mean, when you look yeah. at that, there, there shouldn't be any other ship that size or that shape in that part of the lake. And uh, it, it, it pretty much consensus agreement among most Great Lakes maritime historians is that this is the Chikora. Yep. Yeah. It. Yeah. That's what I say. Like the model. I like the model makers perspective of it. Right. Because they yep. have all the fine detailed drawings and all that stuff. And they matched it all up. You know, from what the ones that contacted me matched it all up, and they said, they said it's the Chikora, and uh, so, um, we, I guess, you know, some people are upset with us because we haven't, we haven't released any video or anything, um, but, you know, Al and I are just kind of, I guess we're kind of odd, and then now if you know Keith, yeah, he 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 rounds out the. Um, and then if you knew the rest of our crew, you know, if you knew Pete and, and Ty and, and, uh, Todd and, <laughs> and the rest and, um, Paul and Bruce, you'd go, huh? Okay. You know, uh, you know, Paul Ehorn, I think you know who he is. He's yeah, on our crew. Well. Good friend yeah. He's on our crew. So, so yeah, we're not, we're not like exactly normal. So no. yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we, uh, People may not realize too is this is it costs a whole lot of money to get out there. This is in the middle of the lake, isn't it? Yeah, it's somewhere out there. Yeah, it's, it's the, far out. Let's just put it that way. And so to say, oh, why don't you give us video or why don't you, you know, that's uh means there's got to be good weather and somebody's got to pet pony up a lot of gas money, doesn't it? Well, yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting that that we've been criticized by the sport diving community. Why don't we? You know, why don't we release the, these positions, right? And and the main complaint is that the U.S. government paid for us to go find all this stuff, so so it should be uh, it should be public knowledge, right? And it's funny because every now and then somebody will post something they're doing a Freedom of Information Act request to the Navy for the positions, and and I know what answer they get back. We have no idea where these things are. And the reason they don't have any idea where they are is because every single second of our searching that we've ever done, every single dollar we've put into our vessels, every single penny we've put into search equipment and navigation equipment has all been ours. The U.S. government does not pay us a single penny to do any of it. So it, it is kind of funny or odd to us when when people demand from, you know, they don't, you know, they verbally demand they, um, positions for things. And sure. so the one thing though, we, we do release positions, you know that, right? Yes. Yeah. We, we released the Wellsburg. We released the wings of the wind and we released the wings of the wind prematurely. And there were people that went and stripped off stuff off it. And I never understood that. We never understood that. Al and I don't collect that kind of stuff. Um, I'll actually show you the kind of stuff we collect. And and it's got to be really odd. And we only collect it out of the aircraft that we recovered that were turned over to us. Uh, in case anybody's wondering, the Navy in one of the agreements turned over three aircraft to, to us. And, and that was, once again, um, the, the director and the deputy director of the National Naval Aviation Museum realizing that only static display in museums was not not in the best interest of the American people. They realized that some of the aircraft should be made to fly so that these aircraft would be toured at air shows and things like that so a whole lot more people could see them. So when they turned over the aircraft to us we, on those aircraft, we, we kept the souvenirs that we thought were cool. So I, I was showing at the beginning of the thing my, my uh, forever water bottle, which is uh, – this was actually one of a water bottle that was um, in the survival kit of one of the aircraft. And it's really funny. I think it's really amazing. Even in World War II, the government was crazy. And they, they put they had they had the manufacturer this stamp on it, property of the U.S. government. So <laughs> why, why would they waste it on a water can? Why would they waste the energy on that? Right. So um, and then the other thing in this survival kit was uh, I always love this. 
uh, I don't know how old you are and I don't know how old your viewers are, but when I was a kid, we used to eat Horlitz malted milk tablets, candy. Well, the Navy contracted Horlicks apparently, and it has the, the original Horlicks malted milk lunch tablets. Very cool. Like that? Yeah. You know, so very cool. <laughs> when we called it candy, I think we were honest about it. They called it lunch tablets, right? So could you imagine you're, you're, you're crashing with these aircraft out in the middle of the South Pacific and you got a can of water and you have a, you have a, a box, of, a, a bottle of lunch tablets. And then, so the other thing in the survival kit was uh, the life raft. And so I kept one of the paddles. So I figure it really wasn't for paddling the life raft around. It was when you ran out of lunch tablets and water, if you were with another guy, you could beat each other to death with these things. <laughs> so the, that's kind of the way I look at it. Then again, I have a weird sense of humor, right? So, but, so the other stuff, the other stuff, kind of stuff we, we, we take as souvenirs or we've taken as souvenirs is, um, you know, during the war, the allies had access to pharmaceuticals that we, we don't realize the access and the, it didn't have as much access to, you know, weren't able to get them. And like, so like we had, the U S had its own, um, plant, um, the tree that makes quinine, we had our own farms growing those trees. Right. So we were able to get, we, you know, our soldiers complained of malaria, but it was better for our soldiers than the Japanese because we had, we had quinine. Um, the Japanese didn't have a lot of it. We also had a lot of penicillin. And but what we find in the aircraft every now and then is this, which is um, if you ever saw Band of Brothers, the medic keeps running around through the show, always looking for surrettes. And this is a morphine surette. So it's kind of cool. Um, this was saving grace for if you were wounded as a pilot. Um, if you've ever had morphine, I had morphine from severe injuries. Uh, it's amazing. They give you a little shot of this. They stick this in your shoulder and squeeze it. And, and the world is all wonderful. <laughs> you you oh, think man. you can do everything. You feel great. And it doesn't matter if you have limbs dangling, you're like, ah, who cares? I'll just, I'll just drive home. Who cares? And it's amazing. So, and then, um, the other thing, like cool thing I have is this thing. I like to show people and you can see what it is. It's, uh, it's something that they don't seem to have too much of these days. Uh, it's a Boy Scout knife. I don't know if there's many Boy Scouts anymore. And my guess is a good number of the pilots in these aircraft were um, were Boy Scouts. And it, there was like a, like I call it a glove compartment where they put their private stuff. We find combs. And eh, anyway, I found one of these from one of the pilots. I actually contacted him and he said, keep it. He told me to keep it. Yeah, he said, it's better served with you because you'll show it to the world. And uh, and I said, cool, thanks. You know, so he was still alive. And I, I asked him if I could have it. And he said, yeah. So, because I was going to give it back to him. You know? Very neat stuff, Terrace. But he said, you, you know, you'll show it to the world. That's what you're doing. Keep showing, showing our history to the world. Unlike the Naval History and Heritage Command, which I believe your viewers never even heard of these guys. And yet That's they get paid. True, yeah. I get, I, they've been paid tens of millions of dollars over the years. And, and none, of, none of your viewers have ever heard of them. They get paid tens of millions of dollars to make Navy history come alive. And all they do is try to obstruct them. Oh, I should get it. I should stay off that soapbox. No worries. We have a anyway. question from uh, from a viewer. Uh, Terrace, yeah. mention Keith kicking the stump. That's a great story. I love Keith's telling of it. What's that? Oh, well, Keith tells it differently than I tell it. So, uh, you know, that's, that's you know, what do they call that? They call that emotional truth, right? Where, where I tell it the way I think it happened and Keith tells it the way he thinks it happened. Right? But, but I have to give Keith credit because he cared about it. I was pretty young and flippant and, you know, Keith's a lot older. Al and Keith are a lot older than I am. You know, it used to be cool when, when I was young and the Naval Criminal Investigative Services or the FBI would come after us because the Naval History and Heritage Command people sent them after us for, with false claims of, of crimes. They, they would, we had a warehouse and I would be there at the warehouse and they'd come over and, and they all thought like Al was my father. And so they would say to me, they'd say, could you tell your father that we were here? And I'd say, sure, I would. I will. <laughs> right, I go home. My father was a was a Cook County Sheriff's deputy at the time. And I go, hey, Dad, the FBI was over at the warehouse and they, they told, want me to tell you they were here. They were there. And he would just look at me like he'd say, why do you do that? And I'd say, why do I do what? And he said, why do you not tell them who you are? And I say, if they're that stupid and <laughs> they'll get a photograph of me, 
I'm not going to help those idiots. Right. So anyway, and then anyway, then eventually they would figure out it's me. And, and then they would find out they were on a wild goose chase that the Naval History and Heritage Command sent them on. Anyway, um, sorry about that. What question did you ask me? Keep kicking the stump. <laughs> oh, OK. Yeah, I am. I, I do have that HDD, H F Q P T D, whatever it is. Anyway, um, I do have that. So so that. I mentioned the aircraft that's on display in Midway Airport, right? Well, when we located the aircraft, we were working on it. And visibility in those days, we felt it was good visibility if we had 10 feet. Normally, we had about six feet, right? Even at 85 feet deep, because that was pre-zebra muscle, pre-guaga muscle. You know, working in six feet was pretty good. Six foot of visibility was pretty good. Well, we all noticed these little cone things dark little cone thing sitting on in front of the aircraft all over, all around. You know, we'd go, we would go by the tail. There'd be some over there. Right. And so Al always says to Keith, cause Keith gets distracted. He might have worse HD, HD, HD than I do. And, and Al always says to Keith, no sightseeing. Well, Keith just had a sightsee. Look at those little things. Now, I've seen a super colony antel, and that's kind of what it looked like to me. And I thought, wait, that's an odd biological thing on the bottom of the lake. Yeah. Well, well, Al and Keith had their theories, right? And I don't know, somebody, I think Al thought they were for some reason, like somebody had put, put something on the bottom. I guess they have fish traps somewhere where they put a piling in or something. I don't know. Anyway, I, don't, I can't remember exactly what everybody's theory was. To me, I thought it was biological. Like, but not biological as in botany type biological. I thought it was biological that there was like some kind of organism that was excreting or something. Well, Keith went over there. And, well, we knew a we knew a coastal geologist. Uh, I think they call him a limologist, Frank Pransky. The guy was the the guy could take a piece of clay, lick it, and tell you where the glacier had pushed it from. Like I'm telling you, like what county, what street in Wisconsin the clay had been pushed from right by the glacier very interesting and so so keith said well let's let's well keith anyway keith broke one of them and brought it up and we realized it was wood so keith said well let's give it to frank maybe he'll know well frank frank was kind of a funny guy he didn't really care at first but but he was humoring us so he had it carbon dated and he sent it to these two labs and they came back with now this is back 30 years ago right he they came back with 8,130 years plus or minus five weeks, five, five years or something, right? Wow. Well, all of a sudden, you got really interested, right? Now, all the people who believe that the earth was created 6,000 years ago um, don't believe this story, but um, what it did was it, it, it triggered all these geologists to say, wait a minute. How could there be trees at that depth of water that are a little over 8,000 years? They died a little over 8,000 years ago. Because the theory, and I'm not an expert on this either. I don't know jack about it in reality. The theory was that 12,000 years ago, the glacier came, pushed, made the lake, formed the lake bottom, melted, and we had the lake, right? So this, these trees said... No, there was not water there 8,150 years ago. So anyway, they did a whole bunch of stuff. They brought they, <laughs> they brought U.S. Geologic Survey and National Geographic, and they brought all these people. And, and I don't think I put this in the book, but it was funny because they couldn't figure out how we found these tree stumps. And so... It's kind of weird. They would start saying that we were searching for shipwrecks. They kept saying, you know, there's a Bachelor of Science, which its initials are BS. Then there's a Master of Sciences, which is more S. And they brought a bunch of PhDs, which I came to the conclusion is really pilot high and deep. Because these guys couldn't figure out how we found the stump. And so they just started justifying in their minds and saying, well, we were looking for shipwrecks and we saw them. Well, something being on the bottom of the lake for 8,000 years is going to have about the same density as water. And it's not going to give you a reflection or return. It just wouldn't. And, and they did a scan and they saw what they described as a snow angel. 
Hmm. And so, so I'm going to, so your listeners understand, I'm going to tell you there's, there's currents on the bottom of Lake Michigan. When there's an aircraft that eddies are created, it has air surfaces, right? And, and so water's going to speed up and go up and over the wings and do that because, well, it created a footprint. They were looking at the footprint. The snow angel was the footprint. They, they didn't put together in their brains. We weren't looking for shipwrecks. We looked for aircraft. The snow angel was the footprint of the aircraft that we had removed. And they didn't know it until my book was published. Really? <laughs> they couldn't figure it out. All these great PhD geniuses could not figure that out. So you found and a forest, forest on the bottom of Lake Michigan. That's really cool. I wasn't aware of that at all. Um, yeah. And A&T is great at keeping secrets, obviously, right? So we weren't going to tell them what, how we really found it. And uh, sure. yeah, so, and the thing is, if we had notified them that we, that those stumps were there prior to us removing the aircraft, oh, could you imagine what they would have done? It would have been every, all this uproar, don't, you know, well, the Naval History and Heritage Command would have said, oh my God, this needs to be a UN UNESCO site. You know, that's what they would have said, <laughs> you know, right? <laughs> so, sure. So, anyway, so we, that's uh, a great story, and I really appreciate you sharing that with us. I, a couple of other things, Terrace. Um, you know, we're down to about nine minutes left. I wanted to uh, talk about your book a little bit. I really enjoyed this book a lot. I, the pictures in it were amazing, and I learned a lot because I'm not an aircraft guy. I'm a shipwreck guy, but this yeah. was a fascinating read, and it got me really interested in the planes. And, and it's a cool story, too, of how you guys did this. Um, tell me a little bit about Number one, why you wrote it, and uh, let's let's talk about where people can get a copy. This is a cool book. Well, it's let's let's take the where you could get a copy first. Everywhere, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. It's not a self-published book. I was I was contracted to write the book, so it's on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. All you do is just put the name in Google, and they'll all pop up. Uh, I think you can get it. I think Kmart even has it. I think Walmart. I, I think everybody. You know, you won't find it in your local Walmart store. You have to order it, right? I bought mine on Amazon. What's that? I bought mine on Amazon. I yeah, I I I I love Amazon now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think they're pretty good. <laughs> they just they just figured it out, right? So um, the um, yeah, Amazon to me, Amazon's the easiest, right? So, and and I'm sure there's a lot of what is it? Prime is that what they call it, right? Um, so I, it's pretty easy. So just put the name, The Great Navy Birds of Lake Michigan. Um, by the time you get to The Great Navy, it pops up because there isn't too much, too many books on, too many subjects, The Great Navy. There's too many subjects. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the... Um, so why'd you write it? What made you want to do that? Well, I, I've actually been writing it all the years. The um, And the thing is, when you see that when I attack somebody in the book, right, um, like the Naval History and Heritage Command, I, I'm a documenter. Uh, Al used to make fun of me for years because he'd say, you keep every email, you keep every scrap of paper, you keep every... I, I have this whole room that is nothing but printed emails and all the scraps of paper. I went into the uh, lots of trouble we had with the recovery of the Hellcat. Um, the um, the, the um, State Historic Preservation Office of, of Michigan, we had a lot of trouble because what Naval History and Heritage Command had told them, yeah, there's the aircraft. Um, but that's really a cool photo. If you could keep that up, I'll tell people about that. Uh, but, um, that. Hold on, I'll go back. So the um, the um, I didn't have all the internal stuff that went on between the Naval History and Heritage Command and the state of Michigan. Well, I, when getting ready to year, years ago, after all the issues with them, um, I went into the State Historic Preservation Office and they said, they handed me this stack that was about that big of paperwork. And they said, there's the copy machine, go ahead, copy it. And so I, 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 I copy everything, document everything. So if somebody in Naval History and Heritage Command, oh, you're gonna believe, oh, I gotta tell you what one of them did. Okay, so if somebody in Naval History and Heritage Command says I'm not telling the truth or I'm a liar, they're full of it. They're full of bovine excrement because I have all the documentation, all the evidence, all the proof, all the things they attempted to do to us over the years, crazy stuff over radium. Um, uh, clear, clearly they were calling 
calling all these federal uh, law enforcement agencies on us and claiming we were stealing stuff. It's just, I have all the documentation I did. I did a bunch of FOI, Freedom of Information Act requests, and they always take years to answer them. And they could answer them in, in a matter of days, but they deliberately, they, they hope that I'll go away, but I never go away. So that's really cool. That photo's really cool. Yeah. Um, for people who don't know, Enterprise Rent-A-Car, which is owned by Enterprise Holdings, and don't hold me to that, but that's my understanding. There's the parent company, Enterprise Holdings, and, and then Enterprise Rent-A-Car, and then they have an, another a, a, a number of other enterprise, uh, another other, ugh, sorry, my tongue, another a bunch of other rental car companies too, right, in their in their whole thing. So what, what we're really big on is bringing everybody into into the project involvement in the project so in that photo what you're looking at is that's but the, the aircraft in the background is the the hellcat that was funded by andy taylor who at the time was the ceo of enterprise holdings and he did it in honor of his father who started enterprise and he named it enterprise after the enterprise aircraft carrier from world war ii he's standing in the basically in the middle of the photo that's Jack Taylor, the founder of Enterprise. He has sort of the yellow tie on. Next to him is a Navy, a, a, a sailor who looked like him when he was young. And we and we they did this to, you know, they took his you know his pilot outfit from the war and they did some photos with the, with that kid. The kid the kid had no idea what he what he what he volunteered for, but it was probably one of the most interesting days of his life. So you know the kids a sailor who's standing next to a guy who I think was worth about $12 billion um, in between Andy Taylor um, and, and Jack Taylor, who has the eye patch. He had very interesting problem, a tooth. Um, he almost lost his eye from a tooth that the right, the right about that time period is, is um, Andy's wife. And then, then there's me. And then next to me are Andy and his wife's two daughters. So there's three generations of the Taylor family, the restoration team, um, Ed Ellis in the red shirt is the fundraiser for the foundation. So these are the people who made this happen. And you notice who you, who's missing from the photograph? Let me guess, the Naval Heritage folks? Yeah, the Naval History and Heritage <laughs> Command absolutely did everything they could to try to stop us from doing this. Yeah, I'm not kidding. It's in the book. And it, it was appalling, the stuff they did to try to stop from us doing this. It was it was crazy, insane, and and Andy Taylor was one of the people. He came in, he he put the money in escrow to do all this, to do the the, the locating, the recovery, the restoration, the rescue. I call it the rescue, all that stuff, and he just stuck with it. He stuck with it through all their nonsense, and um, anyway, so you get the idea. So, so Terrace, I've got a couple other questions. We're 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 up with just a few minutes left, but I do want to get those out there. Um, UC 97, uh, ever going to release the location? Well, the plan for the UC 97 and, and we've had, we had extensive, um, conversations with the state of Illinois and the state of Illinois agreed with us. Oh, uh, the Naval History and Heritage Command tried to claim that it belonged to the Royal Navy. Oh, that's another whole joke. That's in the book too. And, um, the Royal Navy said to us, we want you to do what you're, you want to do with it. And the idea is to actually raise the funds to recover it. Um, of course, Naval History and Heritage Command will oppose that and fight that to the nth degree. But the state of Illinois, actually, we, we worked out an agreement where, where the state of Illinois said, yeah, let's, if you can do this, do it. You know? Wow. So, yeah. Um, so we don't see it. We don't see a point to releasing the position. And the, you know, the other thing is, we don't understand why Naval History and Heritage Command is looking for it. They tried to say that it's owned by the Royal Navy. So what are they looking for it for? And then even if they somehow get lucky and find it, what's their objective? Nothing. They they're not. They never present anything to the American public. So um, not like this, right? They they never do this. So yeah. so we can't we can't even figure out why they would attempt to waste taxpayer money doing that because they have no plans to do anything. They they. It's just that they want to go play around on American tax, taxpayer money. So it's appalling. So we're, we're just about, uh, we're running out of a, a, a time, but one other question that came up uh, that I thought we'd ask, uh, any future plane recoveries that you think will happen? Um, well, the director of the Naval History and Heritage Command said he wanted several aircraft for his 
new National Museum of the United States Navy. Well, I think COVID-19 just ended any plans for the new National Museum of the United States Navy because I can't see Congress funding that now. Um, but we had given him proposal, we had given a proposal like a year ago with the funding mechanism and he has said nobody, no proposals with funding mechanism come forth, which is untrue. We gave him that. The, every couple months I would quest, ask him wh where we are with that. And the last time he sent me an email back, he was going to check to see what black hole that fell down. Well, we know that because his normal his no, his normal responses are, I'll check with staff, I'll speak with staff. Well, the second he says that, we know, forget that idea. So, um, so yeah, I don't know. The Kalamazoo Air Zoo would like uh, the, the one SPD that's about 100 feet deep, and they would just put it on display to – uh, educate youth about biology, invasive species, the damage they're doing to things such as the aircraft. Um, well, we, we know they'll oppose that too. So, um, and my sponsor that was interested in that has had enough of them. So I, I don't know. I've come to the conclusion I think they're going to obstruct everything they can. So my thing is now maybe I, I, see, I, I see a diver saying that He'll shoot video. So, <laughs> so um, we actually want to do that. We actually want to go out to a lot of the aircraft uh, and, and, and shoot the video and present them to the American public cool. through YouTube or whatever. So mm -hmm. we want to do that. Um, right. So, Darius, so, I'm having trouble getting the videos and, and getting our video back up into the stream. Maybe it's because we're over an hour. Um, I can't, uh, the, the software is not letting me. Just so people know, if you're wondering why you can't see us, uh, you're seeing just the logo screen. It's because I'm having a bit of a technical problem with the you BY software. Glitch? What's that? You have a technical glitch? Yeah, the software is not letting me bring the images back up. But anyway, we're just about done. Um, Terrace, um, any last part minute uh, parting shot before I do the housekeeping and uh, wrap it up? Man, you said parting shot. No, I, I think I said enough about Navy history. Parting here. Shot. Yeah. Starting <laughs> Yeah. Oh, uh, I I think the one thing about the sport diving community is is they do they do tell people about this stuff, and um, we are open to like the the one person just sent he'll shoot video. We are open to those discussions, and um, but we want to make a major impact. It's not just for uh, this stuff is this stuff is history for all the country, not just sport divers. Right. And and we we want to we want somehow to make sure everybody understands it. And somehow we, we have a, a huge educational outreach program. I don't know if you know that uh, all the way from middle school, all the way through university level. And so we're always looking for people that can help support that and trying to think of this the right way. We always look for people of means that want to make a significant different difference. You you wouldn't believe we 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 show a lot of this stuff to um, children that we call at risk. They come from uh, educationally and economically challenged families. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't believe the way it changes their lives when they um, when they see all this. They just realize that there's so much coolness in the world that they're missing, and it's amazing. I have kids that I've showed this stuff to 10 years ago. They come up to me and tell me they would have ended up being a drug dealer cooking methamphetamines if they had not seen what I'm showing them and in my presentations. And they tell me how they just graduated from whatever and they're now an aerospace engineer. That's cool stuff, Terrace. And really it's cool all the time. It is amazing. It's all the time that this happens. Cool. And well, Paris, um, I really appreciate you coming on the show. And I mean, that's got to make it worthwhile for, for you, all the work that you've done. And I mean, you've really done some incredible stuff over the course yeah, of it's, 30 it's, years here. It's, we, we've never done this for money. Actually, our joke is how much money did we lose on this project? Yeah. Um, we've, al we've always done other things. Um, Keith actually did the numbers, I think, once if we had worked for McDonald's instead of doing this at the counter of McDonald's. He figured out how wealthy we would be as opposed to. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, we'd have a lot more money, you know, and this stuff actually we, we lose money. We, we, we have to, 
people we have to get paid to pay the insurance companies to pay the marinas the cranes we have you know we have to yeah. do that and but but it's a loser we we did that aircraft in california <laughs> we did that aircraft in california and el said i think the cash register stopped at us losing fifty thousand dollars so and i said sorry <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So it sounds like it's anyways, it's kind of a labor of love, but uh, it's really cool stuff that you've done. Terrace, I, I just want to thank you again for agreeing to do this. And I, this was a lot of work just so everybody knows for Terrace and, and Keith Pearson, they, they, you know, sent a lot of really good material and we, we had to meet a couple of times, you know, so thanks a, a lot for spending the time to do this Terrace. And you can, and, and here's something, and people, um, people criticize me for this, but anybody who wants to contact me, is welcome to contact me. I'll tell them my email address and my phone number right now. And, and it was, was weird. People don't call me and bug me about stupid stuff when I give them my phone number. They actually think through what, what I'm saying. And they, so, so we can do that right now. I'll do it right now. My phone number is 305-794-4457. Actually, if you spent three minutes on the internet, you'd find it because there's press releases out there with it. So, my phone number 305-794-4457. If anybody really has a good idea, contact me. My email address is terrace at c at aol.com, which is T-A-R-A-S-A-T-S-E-A -S -E at aol.com. Once again, T-A-R-A-S-A-T-S-E-A -S -E -A at aol.com. Of course, anybody can message me. Just I just got one on Facebook, a message now. Anybody can message me through Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, it's really easy to find me on both of them. Uh, there's not many terrorist Lysenkos in the world. So, <laughs> so anyway, so, um, yeah, so. Well, well and, thanks again, Terrace. I, I do have a little bit of housekeeping before we wrap right. Um Just want to remind thanks. everybody, uh, next week, uh, Wednesday, uh, March 25th, I've got Wes Olszewski, the, uh, the, the Great Lakes author. Uh, I think he's written about 30 different books on uh, Great Lakes maritime history since, uh, oh, I think his first one was back in the 80s. And um, he uh, is going to be joining us. After him, we've got uh, another uh, Great Lakes author, Fred Stonehouse. So uh, feel free to join us for that. We have uh, new content coming up all the time on the channel. And uh, thanks again for everybody who tuned in and participated. And feel free to reach out to Terrace if you have a good idea. I really think that was really generous of him to, you know, offer that, uh, you know, if, if people are interested. So Terrace, thanks again so much for doing this. Oh, yeah. thanks for having me. And uh, thank your audience. Thank you to your audience. And um, like I say, anybody wants to contact me, contact me. And oh, just so you know, I don't make, we don't, the book doesn't make much money. The idea of the book is to get education out there. So, gotcha. um, so anyway, so yeah, so I, I, I tell people buy the book and make sure others see it just for the just for the story, the, you know, the understanding. You know, um, and it's not it's not a local history book. It's actually a book on um, American humanities. Is really what it is, right? Very so, cool. Yeah, when you when you read it, it just happens to be the subject of recovering World War II aircraft, but it's it's really a study of our government and and all the rest, right? So. It's a great book. I, I really enjoyed it, and it's a good. Well, addition. thank you. I'll I'll send you your check for saying that. So. No, it it really is. So, everybody, thanks so much for joining us. Oh uh, wait, wait! I do want to tell you what one of the one of the one of the brilliant geniuses that uh, one of the brilliant geniuses did. You know, everybody has rated my book five stars. Well, one of the one of our brilliant genius friends. So they got me back. They put a one star rating on Amazon. They got me. Oh, uh, it's a pretty good book. All no. Right. I but you get the point. They they did that, so you know that was going to get me. They put a one star rating to ruin my ratings on the book. So, sure, sure. <laughs> All right. what what pathetic people they are. So, well, anyway, they wish they wish they could have done one hundredth of what we've done in their you know in 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 our lives. So I'll give um, you. I'll go out and I'll go out and give you an offsetting positive rating. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, now I got to raise the amount of money on the check. All right. So, <laughs> all right. Have a, have, have a all great right, everybody. night. Thank, Thank you. Everybody. Thank you, your audience. Uh, have a right. good night, everybody. And Tara, stick around, and, uh, and 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 we'll have the after the after chat. Good night, everybody. And all oh, right. But I, I can't forget this. This is going to be posted on YouTube for those of you. It's a private group, so you can't share it. But I'm going to post it on YouTube, and I will uh, put the link on the site. 
and I'll send the link out to Terrace too. And uh, and you know where our YouTube channel is. I've put links to it before. If you want to share this video with friends, you can share it off of YouTube. So feel free to do that, everybody. Good night, everyone.